It's not always about the almighty dollar and how much you can you can get out of uh, out of each commodity. So with every stride, horses are putting huge forces on their joints and their bones. Yeah, we're ultimately we're about winning races. There we are, guys. Ultimately, we're about winning races. Here for the horses. Well, it's that time of the year again, Spring Racing Carnival, where we see all the top horses from around the nation racing to their death, I mean racing to win, and find out how much money we can profit off exploiting these innocent creatures. That's right, a time when the media and the government and betting agencies shove it down our throats. How great it is! Oh, the tradition of horse racing! Mmm, can you smell it? Spring Carnival! And Melbourne crap, I mean Melbourne Cup. Get ready guys, possibly the greatest propaganda piece that's ever come out of this nation. Here for the horses. It is just an absolute first class in how to make great propaganda that Channel 7 has put on for the public and convinced them that there's nothing wrong with the horse racing industry or horse racing in general. Oh, this is beautiful. So we're first starting off with this like nice really classical piece of music. Get in here tonight. Looking forward to see a foal be born. Oh. It'll be pretty amazing to see that firsthand and really see the start of you know, a horse's journey. Well, take note of that journey, the word journey. This horse's journey. Feel the music. Oh, there we go. Girl, oh, there's a hoof. Good girl. Good girl. Wow. Well done, Mum. Little girl. Feeling's just unbelievable. <laughs> Feel that little heartbeat. Well done. Oh, look at you. It's such a privilege to meet you. It all begins here, hey? It begins. It all, it all You're at the start begins. of your journey, just like me. Start of your journey. Remember that journey. Just like me. Or oh, a grand sweeping shot of a race course. The sound of the galloping. You know, the start of the, the life, the, the birth of a horse, like how beautiful it is. Like, yeah, of course it's beautiful. Like, yeah, all that was great. But like the best part was the wording they use in this. Journey, just the beginning of its life, beginning of its life in horse racing. It's journey in horse racing. Now, this is really funny because you think of the, the hero's journey and it's generally like the, the character chooses its journey. They are on a farm helping their aunt and uncle and this, this Jedi, this Jedi visits them one day and then they, they go, this is it. I need to leave my home planet and figure out who I am. That's the start of their journey. Not, hey, little horse has just been born into the world just this very second. I just pulled you out. You're now a racing horse. That's your journey. I'm Josh Gibson, former AFL athlete. Across my AFL career, there were plenty of highs and lows, from premierships to injury. Oh, he's landed badly there. But there was always one constant, and that was my love for horses. Although it was my dad who sparked my interest in racing, it was through my mum that I developed my love for the sport. Because of her, I always look forward to one special season on the Victorian calendar, the Spring Carnival. Spring Carnival. There you go, guys. Spring Carnival. Everybody is vivacious, excited, happy. Anticipation, expectation. There's nothing quite like racing. Happy, anticipation, expectation. There's nothing quite like racing. I want to ensure that racing's round for the next generations. I want my son to be able to love horse racing just like I was able to growing up. But in order for that to happen, I need to dive a little bit deeper. I need to embark on a journey which is going to involve me looking inside this industry and really making sure that horse welfare is at the front of their minds. To do this, I'm going to follow the horse's journey from foal to track and well into their post-racing careers, witnessing every pivotal moment in between. And now being a retired athlete and working in the horse health industry, I'm going to be speaking to some people to get their inside information on what they are doing to make sure that horses' health is number one and it's not just the prize money and the accolades that we see on TV. And it's really interesting because I think I'd rather have uh, like a horse behavioural expert on the topic or someone that studies um, zootology or something 
rather than a retired AFL player. This is an industry that has given my family and I so much joy over the years. But I can't begin this journey without acknowledging a few incidents that have cast a shadow over the sport in recent years. Starting with the very public breakdown and euthanasia of Anthony Van Dyke in the 2020 Melbourne Cup, the second in three years. There we go. There we go. So now we know why this documentary has been made. The death in 2020, Anthony Van Dyke, and how that shocked a nation and how people really started questioning or people kept questioning horse racing and the Melbourne Cup. If there was something wrong with horse racing and if horse racing should really keep going, if we really need horse racing. So now we have the real reason why this documentary is being made, to change public perspective, public opinion on horse racing and convince people that there's nothing wrong with it and it can keep going, business as usual. I don't take a challenge like this one lightly. There really is no other place to start than at the top of the tree with the then and current chairman of Racing Victoria, Brian Kruger. Thanks very much for stopping in for this no, meeting. No problems at all. Grab a seat. I really wanted to do some research into Racing Victoria because, you know, a lot of people just see the racing side and I was actually astounded at how multifaceted Racing Victoria is. Yeah, Josh, it is, uh, it's an amazing industry. It's not just about going and enjoying the races on, on race day. And this here is possibly my favourite thing about this propaganda, I mean, documentary. They've decided to interview, get this, the head of Racing Victoria, Brian Kruger. Now, you know, that's, that's fine. That makes sense. But who's sponsoring this documentary? Who's paying for it? Racing Victoria. Like, it's just, it's just brilliant how they've done this because what about all the critics? What about the coalition against horse racing? What about people that study horses outside of the racing industry? No, we're going to get the head of Racing Victoria to speak on behalf of horse racing who's also sponsored this documentary. Let's really, you know, we're going to sit down and we're really going to dig deep with Brian Kruger and find out everything there is to know. But I'm also being paid by Brian Kruger to interview Brian Kruger. The industry is a very big employer here in Victoria. We have something like 25,000 people that rely on the industry for their, their livelihood. We contribute something like $3 billion to the Victorian economy. And obviously the topic we're here to talk about today, equine welfare, are also critical parts that we need to look after. <sighs> like, isn't it funny? how these um, how industries who get called out for like bad practices or exploiting um, people or animals, they'll often go like, hey, we hire 25,000 people. When people say that it employs over 25,000 people for their livelihoods and it brings over $3 billion to the Victorian economy, that doesn't justify the killing of thousands of sentient beings that don't need to die. Like, this industry does not need to exist. You could say the same thing about almost any other industry. Like, dog fighting. Do you know how much money dog fighting brings into the economy? And how, much, how many jobs that dog fighting can bring? Or what about drugs? How great are drugs? Drugs bring so much money into the economy. Drugs also pay for the livelihoods of so many drug dealers. Just because there's a job and money coming into the economy doesn't justify an industry of exploitation and killing. The treatment of thoroughbreds have recently come into question with a number of public injuries across the last nine years of Victoria Spring Carnival. The most recent, Anthony Van Dyke, who had to be euthanized after sustaining a fracture during the 2020 race. How do you win back some of the public? What do you tell them and what do you show them to say that you're trying to change? The, the Anthony Van Dyke fatality actually hit me really hard. I remember seeing that horse being pulled up and just thinking, oh my God, this is, this is terrible. The, uh, the Anthony Van Dyke incident it just hit me really hard. Like as a CEO of Racing Victoria, I was just, you know, just gutted because this is really going to hurt my, my business. I'm going to, could lose a lot of money from this. A lot of people could not like my industry. So I was really sad. Of course, like it's sad that we had to put down this animal that didn't need to be racing. And yet the only reason why this horse died 
is because they put it into racing. They are the reason of its death. And yet they're acting so sad about it. No one else in the world is as stringent as what we are about making sure that the horses that are running during our spring racing carnival had the best opportunity to race safely. But that's a journey, it's the start of a journey and it will take us, we, we recognise it's going to take us some time. We do take equine welfare as seriously as any other issue. It's, you know, it's if not the most important issue, it's with integrity, it's right up there. 2021 was successful. You know, I don't think I ever played in a grand final with Hawthorne where we didn't have an injury. So that's, that's an awesome result. There we go. 2021, we didn't have an injury at the Melbourne Cup. You know, whoopee. Let's ignore all everything else that happened in the horse racing industry. But uh, Melbourne Cup didn't have a didn't have a death this year. You know, yeah, we did it. Uh, ignore all the others. And once again, old mate Hawthorne player. Uh, yeah, that'd be great. Like if, if imagine that in uh, my grand final for Hawthorne. If uh, you know we didn't have an injury. Yeah. What if we did the same thing in the AFL grand final, which we also have a public holiday for in Victoria? Wouldn't that be really uh, insane? if this uh, AFL football player uh, hurt his leg on the field and then had to be euthanized. Like, do you think we would still have AFL? Do you think we'd still have all those jobs and bring in all this money to the economy if AFL football players were getting put down every year? I want to not only make the improvements, but make sure we're communicating them to, to young people. I want them to have the opportunity that, that I've had to enjoy and love the sport, whether that's as a, an owner, you know, a participant, a punter, you know, a race goer, because I've got so much enjoyment out of it. I want young people that are coming through now to, to look at the sport and go, you know what, that's a sport I really want to be involved with. For me, there's all sorts of different reasons why we need to be good at equine welfare. It's the right thing to do, but encouraging that next generation to be involved in some way or another is something I'd really like to look back on and think we've made a difference in. There we go. You know, I really want to, um, this is the CEO of Racing Victoria saying the reason why he wants to make the industry safer is because he wants other people to continue to enjoy the racing industry. Like he's always enjoyed the race industry. Keep enjoying it. Bring in all the money. Bring in more money. Money, money, money. Keep enjoying it. Like, please, you don't care about the injured horses. You don't care about all the deaths from the horses in the industry. You don't even care about where they go after the industry, which we will find out soon. Don't worry about that. You care about the cha-ching, the cha-ching, ching, ching. Next stop on my journey looking into the treatment of horses in the racing industry, I'm catching up with an old footy mate, Anthony Mithin. Anthony is now the stud principal at Rosemont Stud, considered to be one of Victoria's most progressive and respected facilities. G'day, Josh. Anthony, how are how you, you going? Welcome to Rosemont. Thanks for having me. Yeah, Fantastic yeah. property. Yeah, no, it's a ripper. Unbelievable. Yeah. Here we are. Now we're going to interview a uh, horse racing trainer and it happens to be his old mate, he's a footy mate of his, interviewing a racing horse trainer. That'll probably be a bit biased again, so let's find out about that. How many acres are you on here? There's 700 at this farm, there's 300 up on top of the hill, and there's another 2,500 at the stud farm. Yeah, so basically we take up a lot of land, uh, just knock down all the trees to, um, yeah, let these, uh, let these horses be stuck in these small, small ass paddocks by themselves quite often. Um, and just days and days of training for their journey, 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 journey. Um, yeah, don't worry about the wildlife that we had to knock down for this, these paddocks just to have a horse on. Don't worry about that. Worry about the, worry about the jobs, jobs in the economy and the cha-ching, cha-ching, ching. So we basically have a horse trainer, um, or, you know, manager, what do you want to call them, who just has the best facility so we're, net, we've in, we're interviewing the best facility. We're not checking out the worst facilities, but the best facility for horse racing. Yeah, what about the bad, the bad facilities, the bad trainers, you know? What about the ones that don't have clearly all this land, all this money? What about those ones? No, let's just interview the good one, the cream of the crop. And then some 12 days later, we were running in a Melbourne Cup. And they're racing in the Melbourne Cup. It didn't matter where we ran, what happened from there. I, I've never run 17th and felt so good. good. So what's the plan for him now? Certainly got a home for life here at Rosemont. I was going to say... We've named the paddock after oh. Runaway, right down on the river. Plenty of gum trees in it, and um, it's the Runaway Paddock and will forever be the Runaway Paddock, and that's where it'll end up. Such a good story. Yeah. So we have a horse that uh, we trained very well, and this horse was quite a victory for us because it won races and it won money for us. 
So we're now going to look after that horse for life. We're going to name this paddock after that horse and we're going to let it live out the rest of its life here because it won lots of money, it, you know, won lots of races and it was quite a victory for us. It was a real success story. So this horse, this horse will look after, you know, for the rest of its life. It's awesome hearing stories like this one, a thoroughbred being celebrated, not just for winning, and especially one that will have a good home after his career ends. And that's something I plan to investigate later. But right now, I'm heading back to where it all starts to find out how young horses are treated early in their lives and catch up with a newborn filly. What happens to the rest of the horses? The ones that don't win all the races? What happens to all the other horses that do win the races what happens to all those horses? We'll find out later, don't worry. I was lucky enough to be in the tower and deliver this one. Are you happy with the way that this little filly's come out? Looks brilliant, really, really strong. Nice little filly. I'll actually do a check now. Check yep. it, it'll, uh, do its heart and lungs, take its temperature, and I think you might be able to give me a hand with that. Okay. So here we are again. This is, this is that great documentary, you know, it's a hero's journey. So we started with the birth of the horse, now we're catching up to see what the horse is up to, this little little tucker, you know? This, this journey that the horse didn't choose, but it's on, you know, from day dot. So how many foals did you say have already hit the ground? We've got 14 on the ground at 14. the moment. Yeah. 14. They've had 14 foals. 14 baby horses right now. This is insane. The amount of breeding this industry does for a racehorse. That won't, most of them won't even compete. It's just mind blowing. And you can see each foal is with its mother, even though it's a group situation, they still follow, follow their mothers. Right now they're with their mummy. It might not be, they won't always be with their mummy, but right now they are. For most of these young horses, the next step in their journey comes when they are 12 months old. Journey from when they're 12 months old, that'll be the next step in their journey. So right now they get to hang out with their mothers. Oh, look at the, this beautiful footage of a baby horse and its mother. Isn't that beautiful? Right now they get to do that. For the next 12 months, the next step in their journey will begin. I'm off to witness the yearling sales at the William Inglis and Sons World Class Auction Facility. The auction facility. The auctioning of horses. Good to see ya. How are ya? Fancy to see you. Hey, we got our other character back. His, his old mate Anthony. So they're moments away from getting sold to the highest bidder. At this point in time, you, you, you're probably a bit emotional because you do get attached to these horses and there's time that you think, oh, am I doing the right thing selling this horse? It's a beautiful horse. We've had it in our life for 18 months. You, you hope that they go to a good home. I've sold horses for less money knowing they're going to a better home. Yeah. Um, it's not always about the almighty dollar and how much you can, you can get out of, uh, out of each commodity. They're not commodities. They're animals and they're beautiful. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Did you hear that? Commodity. It just come out of his mouth, just rolled off his tongue so smoothly. Even though it, it, it's commodity. They're not commodities. No, 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 they're not commodities. Even though they are, they're not. Here we go. One of the definitions I found on commodity. A rare material or primary agricultural product that can be bought and sold, such as copper or coffee. This is basically an object. These horses aren't seen as, you know, pets to these people, a part of the family. They're just seen as an object, just a piece that they, they can make a profit off. That's it. It's a commodity that they can make a profit off. It's not, it's not anything more than that. You know, we get quite attached to these horses, so it's really hard selling them. Well, then don't. It's that simple. If you really care about these horses, then you wouldn't sell them. You wouldn't try and make a profit off them, you know. That's what you're doing, let's be honest. This information is not just for the buyers. It's also crucial for the welfare of the horse. It helps ensure that any horse is capable of racing into the industry. Here for the horses. Isn't that, isn't that crazy? The, the footage of the auctions showcasing these horses around this room, like inside a room, not even outside, not outside a paddock or something, inside a room. With all these, uh, all these people, just like gawking at them and like taking notes and whatnot, and figuring out who's going to be the best investment for them as a commodity, it sort of reminds you of uh, something else, like a, a a dark past in history in the world, where we also auctioned off living beings. Australia has always had a healthy love of horse racing. 
but there's always been the question of what happens to these thoroughbreds after their racing days are over. The topic was the focus of a 2019 report on the ABC. Here we go, the ABC report. The other main reason why this piece of propaganda is made. Although the report did not focus on the events that occurred in Victoria, it's still something that I want to discuss with the chairman of Racing Victoria. Hang on. Brian Kruger. And once again, we've got Brian Kruger to speak on what happened with the ABC report that spoke about all the horses, all the race horses, they go to uh, the abattoirs at the end of their careers, basically decided that their life isn't worth living because they can't win races. So they just become dog food. So who do we have to speak on behalf of that report? The head of racing Victoria, Brian Kruger. Well, that is really about accelerating what we've been doing in the equine welfare space and obviously talking more publicly about what we're doing. So what have you got in place to look after them? The big challenge has always been what happens with the horses once they leave the industry. You've got to start working on those things from the day they're bred and then it's about developing those opportunities for them. So we do a lot of things like our off the track program uh, which is about retraining horses for their second careers. Traceability has also been a big challenge for us to make sure we know where the horses are and what's happening with them so we can take uh, corrective actions if we need to if they're not heading down the right path. I raced a horse, in fact it was my wife's horse, called Lagerfeld. A very good horse, I think he won six or seven races. He's now moved on to his post-racing career, he's with Racing Hearts, which is an equine welfare therapy organisation and we get to see photos of him helping people get over the, their various issues and I think I get as much joy out of seeing that as I did watching the horse race. My wife probably gets more joy out of watching what he's doing now than when he was racing, but uh, that's a for me, that's a really personal example of some of the outcomes we're getting now with our, the work we're doing in the post-racing area. And when it's you know, as close to you as that, it really has an impact. So there we go. Thanks to the ABC report, uh, naming and shaming the horse racing industry for sending thousands of horses to the abattoirs or the knackeries. Now we're talking about what happens at the end of their career, you know, their retirement plan. And we have one example of a racing horse, one. And which racing horse do we have an example of? His racing horse, sorry, his uh, wife's horse, <laughs> uh, Lagerfeld, who won six or seven races, you know, did a, had a great racing career. Um, his horse is in um, horse therapy, which we'll find out about that soon. So that's the one example of a horse that we know in the retirement plan. What about the costing of those things? Are these left on a trainer? Like how, you know, they sound great, but how are you funding them? Racing Victoria has announced that we're putting in $25 million over a three year period, but it's not just about the money. We need to make sure we're looking at the practices of breeders, the practices of trainers as the horses are going through their racing career. So the money's part of it, but there needs to be just as much effort going into the cultural side. The vast majority, if not all people in the industry understand how important it is to look after their horse as well. Uh, but it's an area we can't stop looking at. There you go. They put $25 million into the retirement plan for horses um, and we'll find out soon how and what happens to some horses at the end of their career. I'd planned to check in with Racing Victoria's post-racing program towards the end of my journey, but I never expected to find them while I was still at the yearling cells. Why do you see this as important for what you're doing for post-racing careers if horses are lucky enough to have a racing career? Every decision that's made in, in a horse's life from the moment that it's um, conceived uh, to birth through to the sales, through to their racing career, impacts on their post-racing life. So it's really important that from the word go, we're all thinking about their, their second career. So now we have Jennifer Hughes, the general manager for Equine uh, Welfare. She's, you know, paid a lot of money, so it's not going to be biased. Let's find out. What's the ideal life for them post-racing, in your eyes? Well, it comes in many different forms, but the key thing for me is that they need to have a purpose. Here we are. The big question, what is their ideal life after their racing career, their racing career, not the racing career that's been decided for them, but theirs. And apparently it's for them to have a purpose because when they are born, they didn't have a purpose. What? We're deciding what their purpose is? Just put them out in a paddock and let them run free and eat grass and shit and sleep and gallop all day. What purpose are you talking about? What human purpose are we now going to give them? As long as they've got a job, they've got something to, to put their mind to, they'll be happy, uh, their owner will be happy, and they'll, they'll have their welfare looked after. A job. We're going to give them a job. Why do they need to have a job? Just put them in a paddock. It's a horse, for Christ's sake. It doesn't need a job. No non-human animal needs a job. They're just existing in this world. 
Why can't you just let them exist? Why do they have to work to create profit? Every horse that's registered for racing has access to all of our post-racing and our safety net programs. And then from our perspective, understanding what our horse is doing post-racing, that's how we're that's how we're going to shape our programs for the future. And then when they retire from racing, there's, there's also a real requirement to tell the industry where that horse is going. So those are all the pieces of the puzzle that are already there. But what we've been dabbling in the last year or so, we've got incentives and programs that encourage people who own our racehorses post-racing mm -hmm. to tell us what horse they've got because we've We've got no jurisdiction once they retire from racing. Mm. And how do we encourage those people to tell us what horse they've got? There we are. How do we encourage people to tell us what horses they've got? And uh, we encourage ownership or people to um, own up, own up to what they're doing with their horses after racing. The thousands, the thousands of horses that retire every year. As the racehorse industry keeps expanding and there's X amount of racehorses retiring per year, is there going to be enough rehoming opportunities to marry up with that? There we go, the big question. There's thousands of horses retiring every year. Is there going to be enough jobs? Because apparently these horses need jobs. Apparently these horses need a purpose. They can't just live. If there's going to be enough of them for all these horses every year. I genuinely believe that we're only scratching the surface of opportunities for horses post-racing. So that's our focus for the next five-year strategic plan is just continuing to explore what are those opportunities. And I've got a team of seven dedicated to that cause. She didn't actually answer the question. She didn't say what happens to these thousands of horses that retire every year. She just said that I genuinely believe that we're only scratching the surface of opportunities for horses post-racing. So that's our focus for the next five years to continue to explore those opportunities. That doesn't tell us what happens to all the thousands of horses that leave the horse racing industry. So what happens to all the horses? So what you're saying is you could be a Melbourne Cup winner and you could have been the best racer there is, but post racing, there's, there's another thing for them to do. It doesn't have to be in a paddock. Absolutely. What? The ex-AFL football player paid by Racing Victoria didn't actually understand that she didn't answer his question. Well, or the fact that like, he's not meant to say that she didn't answer the question. Oh my God. Like it's just pure propaganda. And like, it's so sad how many people will buy this, you know, who will just buy into it. Like, oh, that's great. So all these horses will get a, a job. They'll get a, they'll, they'll go to work. They'll wear their suit and tie. They're not just gonna, you know, go to the knackery. You know, they're gonna really, they're gonna continue to do something for society. They don't have to do anything. They're just a horse. So I'm off to meet a bloke named Rob Palm. The lucrative time for them to be racing is as a two-year-old, so they have to be in a system straight after the yearling sales. So here we are. We got Rob Palm, a, uh, a pre-trainer, a breaker, as they call him, to break a horse into the industry. It's very brutal wording. Two-year-olds, two-year-old horses. They should be just like roaming around with their mums, but no, he's gonna, he's a pre-trainer. He gets them ready. He gets them ready for the horse racing industry. You know, it's, it's integral that I start them off well at the beginning of their career so that I can get them once they've finished their racing and turn them into a performance horse. How many horses come into the racing industry every year? So we're gonna look further into the retirement plan for the horses that leave the horse racing industry um, a whopping number of 13,000 racing horses leave or exit the industry every year. It's just insane. It doesn't, it's not sustainable. It can't exist. So you've obviously got a real love for horses, no doubt. Oh, it's very rewarding, you know, to go from a horse that's never had a saddle on to, to ride them that first time. You spend that time with them and then to see them get to the races, it's unbelievable. Carries on about the, so you really do love the horses. You know, they continue to say like, so you really do love them. You really, so you really do love the horses. And it's once again, it's like the, the wording that's often used in propaganda pieces that they need to continue to embed into the, the minds of the viewer. You know, the lies, the more time you say the lie, the more likely the viewer is to believe it. You really do love the horses. And then for the trainer to be like, yeah, of course I love them. I'm there with them from the start. It's like sending your child off to college and then seeing them do well before they end up as dog food. You hear the term breaking in, it sounds like a quite aggressive term breaking in. What does it actually mean? There we are, the term breaking in. I love when the, they actually do acknowledge what the audience could be thinking. You know, it sounds quite aggressive, the term breaking in. What does it actually mean, you know, to break in a horse? Let's not ask 
uh, someone who's against horse racing. Let's ask you, someone who gets a profit and who gets paid in horse racing. Breaking in is a, is a very old word. I like to think of it as an education process. It's very, it's a very old word. You know, don't really think about it too much. It's, just, it's an old word. You know, it's not a new word, it's an old one. We prefer education process. Like, how dark is that? Another great example of propaganda where they won't even add up to what the term really means. Like, the term education is positive and process is also a positive thing. Breaking them in. Breaking. To break something. How brutal that is. No, we don't like that word. That's very brutal and ugly. We prefer education process. We don't want to intimidate them or force them into anything because nobody learns from being bullied. We don't see the, the thousands of other horse trainers in, in Australia and how they're training their horses. But even in my new love of camp drafting, I'm acutely aware of the realities of all sports. The path to success is never easy and potential injury is an ever-present danger that requires various strategies to manage. I've learned enough about horse racing to understand that these horses are like human athletes. Every second in front of the crowd represents countless hours of training and preparation. Horses are not like human athletes. They are very different. And I'm not a horse expert because they can't decide, you know, if they want to be a part of the sport. They can't pull out at any moment. They never decide to be a part of the journey. Consent is a big term that's quite... Um, it's quite hard to talk about, you know, consent with humans and non-human animals because quite often we take away the consent of non-human animals in their best interest. We don't ask our pets if we can take them to the vet. We just take them to the vet. In this scenario, non-human animals and sports, what we do for them isn't in their best interest. We're doing something that we enjoy to make money off them, not to look after them. Completely different. If we want to look after these horses, they would just simply be in a paddock, roaming around free with all their horse buddies and horse family, and they would be getting fed and they would have shelter and security. They'd be you know, looked after and protected. And when a human athlete gets an injury, they don't get put down on the, on the footy field. Do they, old mate, Hawthorne? So I'm here to see Danny O'Brien to find out how thoroughbreds are trained and what's been done for injury prevention. I understand you're using some new data technology to track these guys. So you're not only just relying on, on the riders. What is that, mate? How does this work? It sounds revolutionary. In the girth, there's a heart rate monitor and that actually goes live to my phone. So I'll get a heart rate, I'll get the speed the horse is going and I'll also get a stride length uh, that the horse is going. And we have obviously a record of everything they've done in the- Data, technology, look at all our technology we've got now. We're so up to date with technology. Danny O'Brien Racing um, telling us how he looks at preventing their injuries. We won't look at all the other trainers. No, we'll just look at this one guy who clearly has a lot of money to monitor his investments to make sure they're ready for racing. If the data's terrific and the rider's got a big smile on their face saying how well the horse feels and how much more he thought the horse had to give, yeah. Uh, yeah, they're all the things that you like to see going into a big race particularly. Yeah, of course. Um, yeah, if the, yeah, the, the rider's got a smile on his face and he's really happy with how the horse went and uh, all the data matches up, the, the, the data, data numbers, numbers, matrix, uh, you know, then that's, 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 you know, that says it all. I want to understand, if I were a racehorse, would I really be happy with the quality of training and care that I'm receiving? Which leads me to my next question. If I were a racehorse, how would I tell anyone otherwise? There we go. The big question. If I were a racehorse, how would I tell anyone that I don't want to be a racehorse? How would I tell people? So you have your speed and, and your heart rate, uh, and on this particular one as well, a graph that represents all the pressure that was going through each. You get that individual limb pressure. You do, and, hitting, and yep. there's, a, there's a certain shape in that graph that you really want it to look like. We're just answering all those big questions with not, not, a, horse, not a horse behavioral expert, but a horse trainer, horse racing trainer, sorry. You know, this, docu this documentary is funded by Racing Victoria telling us how we know when a horse tells us they're not happy. Because I, I didn't realise that you guys use this type of technology, you know, and this really shows the level of care 
and preparation that goes into having a horse run on the weekend. You can just make better decisions and it's all about making the right decisions for, for the horse so that you, they have the best career possible. You know, we're, ultimately we're about winning races, so you're not going to do that with horses that aren't performing at their best. There we are, guys. Ultimately, we're about winning races. We're not here for the horses. We're ultimately about winning races. It's, this isn't even propaganda. This is just honest truth. Everything else has been not necessarily lies, but misleading or misinformation. This is just right here. 95% of the time, there's no problems. Yeah, that's but because you're tracking so much data yeah. that you're, you're pulling those horses before those problems occur. Correct. <laughs> it's pulling up that 5% of the time that there is a problem when you get ahead of the curve and it doesn't develop any further. There's another propaganda moment because he's telling misinformation or he's getting, giving us a wrong number. And our holder host here, AFL player, he's just going with it. Yeah, because you have all the technology so you can stop that from happening. No, the actual people that investigate the industry, uh, the Coalition for the Protection of Racehorses, have come out with their report saying that over 139 racehorses died in the industry this racing season. You are exploiting a non-human animal for profit in an industry that doesn't need to exist. And that, that is actually the biggest thing. Like, I hate to keep talking about when I play, but it was, you know, if, if you could get that data early and take yourself out of one session, and you know, you maybe miss one training session instead of doing that big injury and, and you know, doing a hammy and missing a month. And it sounds like it's sort of the same philosophy here with, with the data you guys are collecting now. There we go. Like, once again, old mate retired AFL player going to home with is like, yeah, yeah, like if this was, you know, I had to go on that I'm an AFL player and Racing Victoria hired me to be on this because people connect with that, connect the dots, AFL sport, horse racing sport, we're both sports. If one AFL footballer died in the industry, there would be massive changes. If 139 AFL football players died in the industry, we would probably shut down the whole sport. So... Yeah, buddy, there's a massive problem in the industry and all your technology is not going to change that. <sighs> like so many people are going to believe this. It's exactly that. We're, we're, we're the same as you. you. There's only so many elite athletes to go around um, and when you find them in your system, you just want to do everything to make sure they have the longest possible career they have. And you're not going to do that with horses that aren't performing at their best. They're just wastage as a... Uh, the horse racings calls them wastage. They're a bad horse, they're wastage. And the byproduct of that is you know that the welfare of these horses has just been looked after to the nth degree. Yeah, look, the, you, you, it's chicken and egg. You can't, you can't expect to get good results unless you are looking out for every part of the horse's well-being. Once again, you know, we care about the horses. Once again, I care about the horses. I can't speak for the rest of the industry, the rest of the trainers, but uh, yeah, you know, I care. I care about the horses. It's, it's not. It's not just about the cha-ching. I, I promise, I care. One thing I do know as an athlete, I had plenty of injuries, and you can take all the precautions you want. But unfortunately, injuries still happen. Of course, Danny is not alone at putting horses first. When a horse gets scratched from the races, it's often very frustrating for the owner and the trainer. Sometimes it can be a grand final, could be millions of dollars on the line, but if the horse isn't right, you don't want the horse to run anyway. So we just explain to the owners and be truthful, and generally I find that absolutely fine. In the end of the day, yes, you'll be disappointed, but that's horse racing and the horse's welfare comes first. Just really hitting it home once again that, you know, we take out the horses from racing when they're not ready. You know, we, we don't want to put them straight into the grand final if they could get injured. The, the coaches and the trainers and stuff and, you know, the, the managers, the, the, the owners, you know, they could be really upset and really annoyed when we tell them they've got to take the horses out because, you know, they're going to make a lot of money and they've put a lot of money into these horses. These horses are just an investment. They're just a commodity. But, um, you know, once again, we take them out because we're here for the horses. Not here for the money, here for the horses, yeah. I work with a pretty big team. We've got over 60 vets providing services at the race meetings that are scheduled all across Victoria. It's a really important decision that we make whether we're, um, when we're giving advice to the stewards if a horse is suitable to race or not. It's not just the horse there on the day. There's a whole team of people, weeks, months worth of work that's taken to get the horse there. And so we definitely empathise with those people when we're making those tough decisions, but we still need to make the best decision that we can putting the horse first. Here we are. We finally heard from a veterinarian. Um, now, you know, not a veterinarian who's against horse racing, a veterinarian that's hired by 
horse racing. So a veterinarian that's in racing Victoria. Let's not hear the other side, veterinarians that are against horse racing and know that it's bad for horses and horses die in the industry and will always die in the industry. No, let's let's hear from a veterinarian that works in the industry and is paid by the you know is paid by the industry and you know has a racing Victoria jacket on. In Cup, where everyone watches because the media and the government really pushes that on us, gets it ready and like says the race that stops the nation. Everyone needs to watch it because it's a tradition. That's the the race where we don't want an injury to happen. So we've got to make sure that no horse gets injured in the Melbourne Cup because that's the race that everyone is watching. All the other races, peep, the ordinary person doesn't watch those. It's the Melbourne Cup that they watch. So we need to stop a horse from getting injured there because that will look very bad on us. You know, um, what happens after the Melbourne Cup with that horse? Don't worry about that. We'll, we'll answer that later, but it's just during the race that matters. That's the one that matters. Injury prevention is really important during racing, but it's equally important post-racing. If we can have horses retire that are sound and fit and healthy, it really opens up their opportunities for a second career. Once again, beating that second career. If they can have a healthy horse, then it can have a second career. Not like the horse wants a second career, but for some reason, us humans want it to have a second career because for some reason, Horses work for humans. I had an off-the-track thoroughbred when I was younger. He was a pretty slow thoroughbred, wholly unsuccessful as a racehorse, but, you know, he was a great horse for me. And here's a personal story, another personal story. We love personal stories. This uh, veterinarian had, so, had her own thoroughbred horse when, when they were younger. You know, it wasn't a very successful one, but, uh, yeah, yeah, they had their own one, so they know what it's like to have, you know, racehorses. Perfect having this paid veterinarian by Racing Victoria. So to find out more, I'm off to see the head of the University of Melbourne's UVet Equine Centre, Professor Chris Whitten. So I'm head of the Equine Centre here. Uh, we have both our large research operation, the Equine Limb Injury Prevention Program, as well as our clinical operation, which is the Lameness and Imaging Centre, where we look at lame horses, we do advanced imaging and we assess lameness. Research for racehorses to stop their injuries, that's all just really taking it home, how much money and where that money's going and showing, showing the public. Bone and joints and the bone in joints are yeah. the biggest problems and the fetlock joint as we've got here is yeah. where, where the majority of those injuries occur. It's accumulation of micro damage. So yeah. with every stride, horses are putting huge forces on their joints and their bones. And if you keep doing that, you eventually accumulate micro damage, which if that coalesces in one spot can become a, fr a small fracture, which then can then grow into a major fracture. Oh hear that because that was very valid information with every stride horses are putting huge force on their joints and their bones and if you keep doing that you eventually accumulate micro damage if that coalesces in one spot then can become a small fracture and can grow into a major fracture so it's right there with every stride these horses make puts large strain on their bones and joints that's it. That's the reason why horses shouldn't be in the horse racing industry. And so a fracture, a micro fracture or a massive fracture is definitely going to happen at some point. This isn't about stopping the chances of a fracture happening and breaking a horse's leg. A fracture will happen. Horse racing shouldn't exist. The industry is a danger to horses. Treating them, for me, is not the answer. Yeah. We, we have to understand prevention because most of the, one, by the time they come to me as a surgeon, it's too late. I can patch that horse up and we'll get some more, it'll run again and it'll might even win again, but it's never quite the same horse as it once was. And for me, that's really frustrating. So that's the most important part of the documentary or propaganda piece is uh, the 33 minute mark, where he says prevention is what's most important because, you know, no matter what you do, it can come back, but the horse will never be able to race again. Once it does this damage, it can never race again. And every single horse shouldn't be running at those speeds because it will ruin their bones and joints. It's just not meant to be done.
What, what do you think is the optimal age for a racehorse to be competing? There is good evidence that starting horses young prolongs their career and reduces their risk of injury. So, and part of that is because their skeleton is much more adaptable when they're young. So two-year-old racing is good for horses provided you don't overdo it. And that's the critical thing. Provided you don't overdo it. How many trainers is that? I don't know, but a lot. I'm pretty sure a lot of them would overdo it because money is an, on the line. These horses are an investment, they're a commodity. They need to make money. They don't care about the horses. Horses uh, innately want to run and they want to run in a pack. And so if other horses are running, they tend to want to run with them. Um, yeah, that's a perfectly natural behaviour for a horse. But we need to learn what are the limits of what horses can do and keep within those limits so that we're not pushing horses beyond them. Natural behaviour for a horse, running with other horses, running in a pack. Probably not running with a human on their back, whipping them constantly in solitary confinement, on machines, walking around a showcase room. Uh, and that's the challenge for us and what our research is aimed at, is trying to understand what the horse's skeleton can cope with and to do that safely, and I think we can get there. It sounds like it's definitely the way forward to ensuring that we can still enjoy horse racing, but do it in a safe manner. Here for the horses. So far in my journey, I've spoken to all the people behind the scenes of the horse racing industry. The stud owners, vets and trainers that care for these horses at each stage of their lives. Putting the horses welfare first and all working towards getting these thoroughbreds to the track safely. But what about the people that are literally the closest to them on race day? The jockeys. A jockey. Let's hear a jockey's perspective funded by Racing Victoria um, and put on Channel 7, who's going to have the Melbourne Cup, I'm sure. Once again, biased opinions. Of course, the jockey's not going to slander the horse racing industry. And of course, they're going to say they care about the horses. Here for the horses, they're going to say. Why aren't we talking to the Coalition for the Protection of Racehorses? Once again, we're talking to someone who works in the industry. Well, maybe, maybe it was my fault. Maybe it is fine. Um, but most times, nine times out of ten, they get them back, they cool them off and... There's an issue, there's a tendon issue or there's a, a minor issue, which um, if I kept pushing him, it, it probably would have turned into a big issue. They could be prepping, young horse, owners have spent a lot of money, this race is worth a lot of money. Yeah. You know, do they always, do they always tr trust your judgment? Nine times out of 10. <laughs> Nine times out of 10. <laughs> uh, most jockeys can feel that um, if a horse is pulling up a bit short on one side or it's um, laying in or laying out, um, we all, we all look after the horse first because no one wants a horse to hurt themselves or break down and no one wants to fall. Um, we we want to get around safely so um, we, all, we all know when a horse isn't right and we're not going to push them if they're not. <sighs> don't, I, honestly, I don't care about a jockey's opinion about the horse racing industry. Like it's just not a valid opinion. Yeah, sure, you, you love being around your horses but you're profiting off them, you're exploiting them. That's not what you do with someone you love. You're looking at rehoming these off the track horses. What's the one thing that they need in their foundation to make them successful in whatever their new careers are? Well, it's just like you said, it's the foundation. That's the most important thing. Um, I find horses that are educated well at the start. They make a lot easier work of it when you get them off the track. They already have the basics. If I love them, I normally take them myself. I've heard from so many passionate people on this journey that are working tirelessly to keep horses safe and make sure that they have a good life post-racing. And it's time to see for myself what that life might look like. Okay, here we are. We finally made it to the part of the documentary where we talk about one thing that happens to some retired horses. Remember the CEO of um, Racing Victoria and what happened to his, uh, his wife's horse and she got to all the updates? We're now going to find out what happens to some horses when they retire. So Racing Hearts is an equine assisted therapy practice. We have a team of psychologists and counsellors that work with people in our community with mental health problems and we incorporate their therapy into exercises with our team of off the track horses. Racing Hearts, a little group that um, lets young children be around these horses and give them therapy. 
how do they get these horses? So you said off the track horses, all the horses in your program are, are ex-race horses? Yeah, um, they are. are. they donated? How do they end up finding themselves here? A bit of a combination. Some are donated by trainers, um, some we actually buy ourselves. Um, some are horses that I've ridden in track work when I was riding and I've kind of followed their career and made sure that they ended up here with us as a therapy horse. Mm. We've had some horses from the Racing Victoria Reset program that have come here. Not the 13,000 racehorses that leave the industry, just some, just some of them, where they get to continue working the their rest of their lives with their, a purpose, because for some reason a horse has to have a purpose. Not all the animal sanctuaries around this country, like Forever Friends or Edgar's Mission, Free Spirits, these animal sanctuaries that just give horses a home to just be a horse. No, the horse has to continue working with a, a purpose that we determine for them. Did you ever have anything to do with horses before coming here? Not really. No? What Bond, have you learned? Bond with them and yep. control my emotions. It makes me feel better because every Thursday I remember that I get to come here and I get happier. You get to come every Thursday. I might have to start coming to school with you. Of course this is great. This is a great business and this is a great, a great initiative. But like I mentioned before, this child can meet horses at animal sanctuaries like Forever Friends, Free Spirits and Eggers Mission. We can have animal sanctuaries without having the horse racing industry. And also, we don't have enough animal sanctuaries to home 13,000 X race horses. So where do those 13,000 X race horses go? Are you going to mention what happened in the ABC report about the abattoir or the knackeries? No, just get right past that. Gets my emotions in check for at home. It's oh, like yeah, everything funny. you were telling me out there with your psychological background, we did a great. She's just implemented as a grade six, yeah. giving the gold answer. I just got really teary when she was talking. It. Like I'm usually really good at like holding it together because they're, they're such good kids and they just need a bit of direction sometimes, you know? It's, it's not always anybody's fault. Yeah. They just sometimes get a bit lost, but when you hear, you know, when you just hear um, directly from them, like for a kid for her, of her age to have such awareness that it actually helps regulate her emotions, mm. that's huge. Another great piece of propaganda, putting in the emotions, you know? get those the, the little tear jerks, you know, oh, child, children, children just, you know, they're sweet hearts, they're sweet, innocent hearts. They could really make you melt. You know, the innocence in a child is beautiful. It's so, this is such a good propaganda piece. Like, you know, someone's going to be sitting at home watching Channel 7 going, oh, look at that. The, the innocence of a child is so beautiful. Horse racing, it's, it's doing good things. Like, they care about the children. It's just so bad. Like how they try and pull at your heartstring like this with a child. It's like, go speak to an animal sanctuary, like I said before, and see their point about the horse race industry. See what they think about it. Throughout this journey, I've been amazed by the level of care and dedication of everyone throughout this industry. Care and dedication of everyone, everyone, everyone throughout this industry. Great misinformation, misleading and misinformation. Brilliant use of wording from this brilliant propaganda piece. Do we meet everyone throughout this industry? No, we didn't. But we're going to say level of care and dedication of everyone throughout this industry. We're going to, Racing Victoria is going to stand behind those words, everyone throughout this industry. An industry that's now a world leader in equine welfare. And what's even more impressive is that everyone I've spoken to has the drive and passion to keep getting better. Everyone I've spoken to has got a drive and passion to keep getting better. Everyone I've spoken to, paid by Racing Victoria. I really wasn't sure where it was going to take me, but eight months on, I'm just so surprised and so happy with the people I've been able to meet, the horses I've been allowed to see along the road. For instance, take this little filly here, Cha Cha. You might remember that she was right at the start of this story when I was lucky enough to see her fall down just a couple of paddocks away. There we go. We're finally seeing this little filly, uh, uh, Jaja. Finally seeing Jaja at the end of the documentary. You know, you might remember that at the start of the documentary, we got to witness her birth into this world and the start of her journey. To be back here now and seeing her eight months on, looking as healthy as she is, and enjoying her early stages in life is so pleasing. She's going to become a racehorse and she could die in the industry and she, you know, could go to the abattoirs afterwards. 
And after all this, I can safely say horses like Cha Cha have a bright future because this industry really is here for the horses. And then ending on that great slogan, here for the horses. Just constantly, once again, the more you say a lie, the more people are going to believe it. Here for the horses. It's the title of this propaganda piece. And ending it on the slogan, here for the horses. You know, and just in time for the Melbourne crap, Melbourne Cup. Well done, Racing Victoria, for making one of the best propaganda pieces this country has ever seen. Will it work? Of course it will. Should it work? Of course not. Because of what I've said before, there will always be bone and joint fractures. No horse should be running at this speed and this pace all the time, every time, because there will be a bone and joint fracture. So what you can do to stop this industry is share this video to spread the word, support organizations like the Coalition for the Protection of Racehorses, um, and support actual animal sanctuaries that do care about animals. So the best thing you can do is spread the word and you know spread your money into other organizations that want to stop horse racing. Anyway, if you want to watch my other videos on the Melbourne Crap Carnival, then you can watch my previous ones here or here.